If there's one thing you should remember from my talk, it's this. While we're living here in this physical world, there's this shadow world out there, this parallel digital domain that's all around us. It contains a facsimile of our lives, a digital trail we leave behind. I want to tell you about how this changed the world I live in, the world of software, and why I think it will do the same to yours. I discovered the lathe purely by accident. It was in the fall of 1994, and I was a freshman entering Harvard. I was an aspiring physics major, and so I got myself a job at the high-energy physics lab, where the project was building some sort of a particle detector, but I didn't understand a lot of the science. My work was in the basement of that lab, which during the heyday of experimental physics at Harvard was home to a giant particle accelerator, as well as a very large machine shop. And so I worked on the lathe and took metal objects and mounted them on that rotating head and with the help of a very sharp tool, created these metal parts to go into the detector. The lathe played this key role in the Industrial Revolution, making the process of creating parts for other machines more repeatable and precise. And I loved it. There was something magical about turning this blob of metal into this beautiful, smooth, perfectly symmetrical object. Now, my love affair with the lathe didn't last very long. After only a few weeks of the job, the guys at the lab discovered that I was a few months short of my 18th birthday, so I was demoted to a far less interesting corner of the lab. And so I realized that the lathe wasn't actually the first machine I fell in love with. That was in Tel Aviv in 1983, where my stepfather was one of the employees at um, IBM in Israel, where we were one of the first to get access to their machine, the IBM PC, pictured here. Model 5150 had all of 32 kilobytes of main memory. No hard drive, but two, mind you, two floppy drives. And sure, I could play a couple of games on it, but the thing to do with a PC back then was to program it, and sure enough, it came with a stack of manuals, one of them for the programming language BASIC. Well, it turned out to, to a seven-year-old boy who didn't speak any English, BASIC wasn't so BASIC after all. So I remember typing every single program from that manual into the computer just to see what it did, and that's how I taught myself how to program and read English along the way. So at the end of my first semester at Harvard, I realized I had a choice. I could go with physics, or I could go with computer science. I could play with atoms, or with bits, if you will. And I realized I had a lot more fun staying up all night doing my programming assignments than banging my head against physics equations. So I went with computer science and haven't looked back since. You see, in talking to the geeks around me, I realized that I wasn't the only one to think in programming, of programming in very physical ways, as if editing a program was just as real to us as shaping a part out of a metal block on a lathe, as if bits were a medium, computers were our tools, and coding was a craft. Now, if coding is a craft and bits of the raw materials like metal ore, fossil fuels in the industrial era, there's something very funny going on with the bit supply. You see, bits used to be well-behaved. They lived in the floppy drive that I had, and when I wanted to play with them, I'd pop it into the computer, and when I was done, I'd put them back. But then three things happened. First, computers became more powerful, and as they did, the bits started moving around faster, and then the internet happened and changed everything. The bits could move around over a network between machines. And then everything went digital, and I mean everything. The people in my field call this phenomena big data. I think of it as a digital outbreak. <laughs> Every move you make is tracked by the cell phone in your pocket. Every purchase you make, every search you type into Google, is tracked in this digital domain. Every thought you have, you enter into Facebook, and this has had a remarkable effect and a revolution. 
Imagine living in the middle of the Industrial Revolution, everything changing around you. Well, I argue there's something different about this one because bits as a medium are much more malleable than metal. Computers as tools are much more accessible. You don't have to spend millions of dollars to create a factory. All you need is a computer and you can make an app and put it in the app store. And the payoff, the payoff is huge. If a two-year-old, 13-person company named Instagram could sell for $1 billion to Facebook, then what can't happen? It's this crazy world I live in, the world of software. Now, software engineering wasn't always like this, though. It started by borrowing processes and methods from the world of manufacturing, this process called waterfall that had a focus on very specialized role. You had an analyst talking to customers about what they wanted and writing requirements document, giving them to an architect who would design some code. And only months later, a programmer would actually touch some code, pass it on to a tester, et cetera. It's this human assembly line. This focus was on skills and training, certification. Not only was this not very effective, it was downright oppressive. The manager was this master. The coder was the apprentice. Let me tell you a story. When I graduated, I started a PhD program, but also a small company with two friends. One was a junior at Harvard. The other was a freshman. We took him out of ice cream socials to, to do this with us. And within a year, we, we sold the business to a local company, 500 people, publicly traded. It didn't, realize me, it didn't take me very long to realize what I was getting into, because I got this email from a woman in marketing with an Im image file as an attachment. It was the new splash screen she wanted me to put on the product. Now, that's the image you see when you first launch an application. It has the name of the product, name of the company. The problem is it was in the most disgusting, horrendous shade of green you could imagine. So I walked up to my manager and I said, there's no way I'm putting this image file on my beautiful brand new product. And so he walked upstairs to talk to her and he came back down, recounted that she was livid. She said, these people downstairs, until they get a degree in art or design, they shouldn't tell me how to do my job. And I had this moment, I thought, oh my God, I am not gonna last here. I am not gonna be one of these people downstairs sitting in my cubicle, typing, minding my own business. And so when I became a manager a few years later at a different startup, I thought there's got to be a better way. You see, I had an amazing team, but I kept feeling like I, wasn't the, I was the only one who had the master plan. As a result, all the responsibility and all the stress. It turns out that there was an answer. This movement that was starting at a time called Agile Software Development, and like all good movements, and it did a manifesto. That manifesto, some pioneers in the industry came up with it, had four tenets, but the first of which was that you should emphasize individuals and interactions over processes and tools. This caused people to totally rethink the way we build software. There were two important ideas. One is that if you're going to fail, you better fail fast. Don't spend months and years writing documents about it before you realize putting it in front of a customer that you're on the wrong, wrong track. Make a working prototype and show it to a customer after a month. Better yet, put a version of it in the app store like those guys at Instagram surely did. The second idea was that you should invert control and responsibility and ownership and place them in a team, a self-organizing team. Empower them to do whatever it takes, whatever they want to do in order to get the job done, and month after month, crank out software that delights the customers. Now, of course, it all starts with the right people, and finding the right people starts with hiring. I once heard D. Hawk, who was the founder and CEO of Visa, quoted as saying that you should hire and promote on the basis of, and here he gives a list in strict priority order. First, integrity, integrity. Then motivation, then capacity, by which I think he means some innate ability or raw talent, then understanding, then knowledge, and last and definitely least is experience. Think about it. I want to tell you about the first hire I ever made. It was for a summer intern. The three of us running this little startup decided we could get some help. And so we recruited some students. 
This guy came along, he had no experience in commercial engineering, software engineering to speak of. He didn't even know the programming languages that we needed. But he told us the story about how when he was in high school, he was really into ham radio, you know, radio handsets, big antenna in the backyard. And he was talking to people all over the world. And he kept hearing these clicking sounds. And he took that to be you know, them tapping on the keyboard halfway across the world. And he realized that where there was a keyboard, there's a keyboard cable, or there was back then. Where there's a keyboard cable, there's electromagnetic radiation. And maybe that was getting captured over the radio wave. And so he wrote a program, a digital signal processing algorithm to decode that signal. And so sitting there in his basement, talking to people across the world, he was able to see on his screen what they were typing on their screen. Of course, we offered him the job on the spot, and he ended up helping us rewrite our product and get acquired two months later. But the punchline of the story is that a few, month, a few years later, as he was graduating from Harvard, I got a call from the NSA doing a background check on him. Apparently, we weren't the only ones to discover his superior signal decoding skills. But what I love about the story is that in the middle of this physical world we live in, the, these analog radio waves, he was able to find this digital door, cross over to this other world of bits and information. And he's not the only one. This happens all over the world in almost every field. It's the campaign manager in a battleground state using campaign micro-targeting voter databases to decide how to spend precious dollars crafting just the right message for an ad for those few undecided voters, or the relief worker in Haiti using mobile technology and digital maps to direct resources to just the right locations in the wake of that disaster, or a major league baseball manager and his stats head of an assistant looking and mining the digital trail baseball players leave behind to decide how to scout for talent using a fraction of the budget of the big teams still managing to win. And in manufacturing, that lathe, unchanged for so many years, is being replaced by 3D printers, layering material to create these 3D objects with internal structures that it's simply not possible to create using subtractive practices like the lathe or a drill. And that's happening today, but in the future we're going to have bioprinters with human cells as the ink, creating 3D structures, human organs, a heart to be implanted into a patient's body. That is amazing. And so this digital domain exists around us, and to a new generation of digital craftsmen, it's just as real as this physical world. This information explosion has revolutionized my field. It has had a remarkably democratizing effect, bringing power to the people who can access it. But my question for you is, are you ready? Will you look for these digital doors and if you find them, what kind of impact could you have? Thank you.